great. Um, I'll just start. Um, my name is Michael. This is Alex. I'll talk a bit about the history and the story and how it all came together and what we're doing with Magic Lantern. And Alex will go into the more technical side of it and talk a bit about photography and what we've, uh, we've done there. So, whom of you has a, has a Canon camera? Are there any, any Canon users in the room? So, you can see Canon cameras. They are pretty widespread and a lot of people use them. Um, I'm not sure why we've spent so much time with, uh, with Canon at first and not Nikon, but that's how it happened. So we've got a workshop on Friday and please join us if you're interested in hacking your devices. Um, so what is Magic Lantern? It's a, it's a free open software firmware add-on for uh, EOS cameras. With um, add-on we mean we're not flashing the devices. We are we're doing differently, which has a couple of benefits. Um, and it's developer hobbyists in our spare time, but it's used by a lot of people and professionals use it for their jobs as well. So it's quite stable by now. Um, and we try to add not only photo functionality, but uh, also video functionalities. So the idea is you can take those uh, very good uh, sensors and use them for video capture as well. Um, it runs from the SD card, so the software we're producing, or the CF card. And um, as I said before, we are not flashing, we're just um, executing it. Um, so we have 18 acti active ports at the moment for all the different cameras that are out there. And new ports are coming whenever someone feels like uh, finding out how to run it. Usually the difference is not so much between the cameras, so that make, uh, makes it possible to port uh, Magic Lantern to new cameras as well. Um, the community is really pretty large. We've got um, over 300,000 downloads, um, and that's uh, just for the stable release. We don't really know what's happening with the nightly build. Um, and we've got about 28,000 registered users on the forums. So that's not just people that are downloading the software, these guys are actually participating. Um, the source code, as you can see here um, on the graph, um, after 2013 things pretty much exploded and a lot of people joined in. And that's why um, so much functionality came into this project. Um, take this quote with a grain of salt because Olo it's just um, trying to guess at the, at the size of a project. But we've got uh, 76 actual um, contributors just in the last year, so that's pretty good for a project like this. Um, what I said before, it only runs in RAM, so we are not flashing. We either forge a firmware update, so with a payload that gets executed instead of the actual flashing taking place, or once we've done that, we can set a certain flag in the camera that activates um, um, developer mode that searches for an RTX bin file that we can then put on the cards and whenever the card is, uh, whenever the camera is started, um, our code executes and we can take over. So taking over means we move around the memory pools, try to get as much memory as we can, um, and we hook into the original firmware tasks and we try to do all kinds of funky stuff. Mm. So we've got our own man uh, menu, so we are not editing a lot in the original Canon menu, so they, they exist friendly next to each other. And then uh, all the stuff we're talking you, uh, to, telling you about happens. Um, the legal issues, um, well, it's, it's like smartphone jailbreaking, but um, cameras, they have no software ecosystems, so it's not probably as dangerous as in some other areas. But we're careful anyway, so we do not copy any verbatim Canon code. Um, and from a certain standpoint, I think we are more or less safe in the way we do stuff. Um, we had to uh, sign our firmwares, even though they are not firmwares, they need to be executed. And the keys we use for that, uh, we just have them internally, we are not distributing them officially. Um, and there are some ethical decisions. It's, so far we haven't touched any of the Pro 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 cameras. That's because they're a bit expensive for us as well. Um, about the history, um, it was mostly a one-man show in 2009, so the project is about five years old by now. And then stuff happened. So we were inspired by some of the things that happened um, in other hacking projects. We went onto bit uh, bit uh, bucket. Then Alex took over um, as uh, one of the lead programmers, and he has invested a lot of time into the project. HDR video happened in 2011. Then we started the new homepage. That's, this is where all the usual users of the cameras joined in and used the the software, helping us improve it. 2013, a lot of stuff was happening. So. 
So we added a lot of modules. There was 14-bit raw video recording, which is very interesting. I'll talk about that later on, but it really pushes these cameras to the professional film, cam film cameras, you know, from Hollywood. And they are about two and a half thousand euros only, even the best uh, Canon cameras you can get in this segment. And also the last three months, a lot of stuff has happened, lots of refactoring and um, new formats, RSA image encryption for those people who need that in the field, um, a unified audio framework, some scripting, and Alex will talk about a sensor upgrade. Just a short information, 14-bit raw video, the idea is you take the raw sensor data from the sensor, you don't do anything with it, you just pipe it through, put it on the card, and then on your, on your box at home, you can edit that footage. You debury it, you sharpen it, you do all kinds of stuff with it. You've got the full 14-bit color information, which gives you all kinds of possibilities to grade the image. Okay, so this is how it looks with the standard H.264, and this is how it looks with RAW. You can see how the highlights are retained, how the details are retained, all that kind of stuff. So it's your turn. Okay, so... so <coughs> As you may know, Magic Lantern is very popular for video. You know that uh, this raw video discovery was uh, increasing the phone traffic like, I don't know, tenfold or something like this. But uh, for myself, I use, I'm mostly a photo guy. So one of the most, uh, answer, uh, most asked questions in forums, like uh, camera rumors or photography on the net, it's if I just stay, take uh, still photos, no video, what can Magic Lantern do for me? And I thought to fill this gap a little and present three main features that I use, like every time I use the camera, I use this feature all the time. So if, you look at, if we look at the development history, right before the raw video, you can see that uh, the first breakthrough was uh, finding the photo image buffers that get saved into the raw file. So with this uh, raw, buff raw buffers I was trying to get correct overexposure warnings to tell when a picture is overexposed or not. A while ago we found the live view buffers which was a huge discovery. So the same raw data was also avail available in live view at uh, 30, 30 frames per second. And like a week later or something like this, we found out a way to write this data stream uh, fast enough to, to the cards. So at this moment, uh, the raw revolution began, so a lot of bloggers covered it and it was a real madness. We couldn't keep up with this discovery. But what uh, not many people know was that the raw video discovery was started by a, break, a breakthrough on the photography side. So of course we did not forget the photos still shot. Still shooters. So, why why I was looking for uh, correct overexposure warnings? This this is a JPEG image, and you can see that the JPEG histogram is clipped on the blue channel. Is this picture overexposed or not? No, it's actually underexposed by at least one full stop, but. The JPEG uh, histogram is lying. So, if you record JPEG or H.264, this image is really overexposed. But if you record RAW, it's underexposed. Why, this, why does this matter? Because if you underexpose by one stop, you double the amount of noise in the shadows. So here is a technique to expose to the right. You know some basic rules for minimizing noise, like you should capture more photons, like slow shutter speed or wider aperture. Once you've run out of photons, you increase ISO to reduce electronic noise. And of course, make sure we don't keep important highlights. 
Of course, when you protect the highlights, you underexpose and you add noise. So I try to automate this process. So you tell the camera how many highlights you have okay to clip, how much noise you accept, what shutter speed are you willing to use, maximum ISO. So it's an optimization problem. So here is the problem with Canon exposure meter metering. Here in this shot, the picture was underexposed by around 1.5 stops. And as soon as I changed the framing only a small, a small bit, the picture became overexposed by 0.5 stops. In contrast, with uh, my exposure algorithm, I try to push the histogram as much as we can to the right side without clipping important highlights. So you can see that uh, this method does, does not depend on how do I frame the image. It doesn't care where these highlights are in the picture. So it gets, it gets the same exposure no matter how I frame the shot. In contrast, Canon exposure is not very consistent. Okay, so we have, we, we've optimized the exposure for the raw shooting, but there are still some tricky situations when this is not enough. For example, when shooting from an inside, for like this room, and you also want to keep the detail from outside, out, out of the window. So you may know, or you may not know, that on Canon cameras, the lowest is ISO, ISO 100, is also the most noisy one, contrary to the popular myth. So if you don't believe me, I'll show you with an image. So this is noise at ISO 100. Of course, it was pushed by 7.5 stops in post-processing. And the same image as ISO 1600, of course, push only by 3.5 stops to get the same overall brightness. It's much cleaner. So the two images were, were, take, were taken at the same shutter speed and aperture. So they were taken in identical conditions. So you can see that ISO 1600 is much cleaner. But of course, you don't get highlight detail. You lose four stops of highlight detail. So, is that because noise reduction is kicking in? Uh, no, it's because the uh, the ISO 1600 uses an uh, internal amplification. So the signal becomes much higher than the noise from the electronics. So this uh, low ISO has a lot of electronic noise. Here the signal is much stronger and you don't see the noise, but you also lose the highlights. So by pure luck, by, by playing with uh, the sensor control registers, we found out that uh, we could scan the image at two different ISOs. Like uh, <coughs> half of the lines at one ISO and the other half at some other ISO. We just combined both ISOs and got clean shadows and good highlight detail. So you can compare it. We have highlight details. We have clean shadows. So this is how a dual, a dual ISO looks like as captured. Of course, I run a post-processing utility to get a DNG file that looks like this, just like with ISO 100. But the difference is that I can bring the shadows without the noise. If you try to do, if you try to do this with a stock Canon, you can't. But no problems with the Nikon's, for example. Of course, even the Nikon's can be, can get like uh, one stop of improvement with this technique. If you look on the site of our friends NikonHacker.com, you will see that they also are researching this actively. 
And uh, for future plans, we will continue. We will we'll, uh, keep on adjust, adjusting the sensor registers. So if our math is not broken, we will be able to get uh, almost one full stop of uh, improvement in shadows. So you'll get uh, two times as little noise. The noise uh, will get cut in half. So this should be like upgrading to a new sensor, right? And another work in progress, a C compiler that can run directly on your camera. Your camera is actually a computer. Yes. You will be able to program it with, <laughs> with C code. So we took the tiny C compiler from uh, Fabrice Bellard. We compiled it. We compiled it on the camera, and here we have a proof of concept that prints "Hello World" and draws a small clock. That's it. So it's very difficult to make predictions about how the future will look like. So we we had no idea that we'll be able to do things like raw video or HDR video. And it would be very, very nice. We are, we are actually grateful that the open source community already invited us here. We are here because the dark table people invited us. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> dark table already took our uh, the Flickr algorithm for time lapse and implemented it in their software. And also, if the FFmpeg project also supports our video format. So that's it. See you on Friday. We'll have a workshop. Bring your cameras. And <laughs>
Um, so. But we're open source, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Not a question, but I just wanted to say thanks because I'm a videographer and the software and anything else just makes my life so much easier. Welcome. So don't repeat the question, but he says thanks. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. Firstly, how canon specific is this and how possible would it be for someone to do a Nikon related? I know people here yeah, don't like Nikon, but I happen to shoot it. so. So the question was how Canon related our co and if it would be possible to port it to other cameras? Well, you need to rewrite uh, most of the backend, uh, for example, the tasks, the way of uh, capturing the buttons, the way of displaying things, but other than that, I think the user level features, once, once you have the backend uh, ready, shouldn't be a very big problem. But of course there are many camera specific features so not all, not all of them will be able. But for simple things like an intervalometer or bracketing or I don't know scripting for these things the camera is just a computer. So and my second question if I may have you compared the raw video that you get from the obvious device that competes with this which reduces raw video which is the, the red so the question was if we've compared the raw video from the can cameras to the competition from the professional film cameras like like reds or Alexas. we didn't do this uh, personally but the, you, can, you will find bloggers that already did and? <laughs> yeah it's looking pretty good it's, go it's looking good yeah <laughs> Maybe I can answer this question since I uh, was a Latin course some, some years ago. Uh, the Red does make that uh, compression on the. Um, they enclose the four fire. Uh, they just use the raw four fire plates and enclose them with red plates. So, uh, in the matter of fact, Sorry. It's raw food Yeah, I guess if you want to know more about that, we can just talk about it on Friday. All right. I have to say thank you. Thank you.